Well, uh, we're in First John. If you've been with us, um, you uh, know that already. But uh, we're we're into chapter three. Uh, Pastor Josh started chapter three last week. This week we're going to look at verses four through ten, and uh, we'll we'll read that shortly. But I invite you to open up to it if you want to follow along. First uh, John chapter three verses four through ten. Uh, this past week, I imagine many of you have been tuning in to the uh, March Madness. Uh, heard there's some good games last night, um, but you know it, it's a fun time of year if you're a sports person. If you're not a sports person, March Madness is is the time of year when all the college basketball teams get together and and compete in a tournament, really to determine who the best team in college basketball is. So there's 64 teams that come together and compete, uh, really at the highest level of college sports. So it's a lot of fun to see these athletes performing at such a high level, competing. Um, and, and you know, they have put in hours and hours of training and practice uh, to develop the skills that they have, right? Ever since they were small children, they've probably been practicing um, for, for countless hours. And they've grown to love practice, right? There, there's some practices they probably hate in the midst of it, but there's something inside of them that even when they're done, they like that competitiveness. They like the challenge of it, uh, and, and they like to come together as a team and to work together, and they're all working towards the same goal of being champions, right? They all want to win the championship. Every team in the tournament, that's their biggest dream, that they get to go home never losing. They get to go home with a trophy, and, and they're the champion. But really, it's what's done in their practice that allows them to be successful on the court when it comes to be game day, right? That's when they, they develop all of their habits. So when they get out on the court, it just flows out of them and they can compete really in, in a lot of ways without even thinking about it. It just comes out of them. I was reminded of one of basketball's greats this week, Larry Bird. Uh, many of you are aware of Larry Bird, pr- played for the, the Boston Celtics, um, uh, all-star, Hall of Famer, uh, still involved with the NBA, but I was told during his professional career, he shot 500 shots every day, uh, 500 shots every day. Now, there had to have been days when he didn't want to shoot 500 shots, or maybe he got tired at 200 or 300 or 400, but he would continue to press on to 500 shots, and if you know people at that level, he probably really did press on to every single shot because uh, they're perfectionists, they want to master their craft. Uh, But what he did there allowed him to accomplish his goals, right? He reached the goal. He won NBA championships. He became a Hall of Famer. He's a legend, right? Well, people will always remember who Larry Bird is because of uh, all that he put into it. But there was also some God-given talent that he had nothing to do with, right? Uh, He can't, uh, we can't help it that we're not six feet, nine inches tall and that we don't have uh, this extremely high level of competitiveness, Uh, the intellect that he has, a lot of that's just God-given talent. But he did put in the work to develop it, right? So he could become the best version uh, of himself as possible, right? He's developing that. But a a lot of what he had, he was just born into it. It was just given to him. That was was a gift from God. God created him that way. It was up to him to develop that, uh, which he did through his practice. So how does all this apply to the Christian life? Why, are we, why am I sharing this? Uh, if you think about this in a Christian context, we think about what is our goal? What are we working towards? Uh, I think you look at First John, you look at all of Scripture, it'd be fair to say that uh, our goal in many ways is the person Jesus Christ, right? He, he embodies everything that we are after. He invites people to come and follow him. Uh, you know, we're meant to imitate him. We're meant to absorb his teachings and put them into practice. Uh, Jesus really is the goal. If we obtain Jesus, we know him intimately. He's the gateway to life, right? The gateway to eternal life and fulfillment and satisfaction. So if Jesus is our goal, how are we going to get there? Well, we get there through what we practice, right? That's what moves us forward in in Scripture in multiple places. And what we're going to look at today is that we are to practice righteousness, As we practice righteousness, it sets us up to move closer and closer to obtaining the goal of Jesus Christ. Uh, So as we do that, we invite him to be working in our life. Um, That's what we're going to be talking about today, this idea of practicing righteousness. Uh, Your text might say, uh, keep on uh, 
practice or keep on doing righteousness or to continue in righteousness. It's the same idea of practicing. It's what comes naturally out of us. It's what we have developed to be a habit. It's just part of who we are. Um, so God teaches us throughout Scripture that if we want to be moving closer to Jesus, then we need to, to be putting that righteousness into practice. Um, so let's read the text, and, and we'll see here what it says about righteousness and talk about it a little bit. First uh, John 3, 4 through 10 says this, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the very beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So we see here again, uh, as you've probably become accustomed to by now, if, if you've been following along with this uh, series, John's speaking pretty straightforward, right? Pretty clear cut language. He's not leaving too much there uh, that would be difficult to interpret. Uh, uses some strong language referring to, to people who don't practice righteousness as uh, sons of the devil versus sons of God. He says, uh, at one point, he says that the children of God uh, will not keep on sinning. In fact, he says they cannot keep on sinning. Uh, so that really raises to the surface a little bit of tension in the text because here he's saying children of God cannot keep sinning. That's the idea that we're obtaining some sort of perfection, right? If, if we're not sinning, we can't sin, then we're living perfectly in righteousness. And you go back to chapter 1, verse 8, and we see that if you say that you do not have sin in you, you're deceiving yourself and the truth is not in you. So chapter 1, John says, tell me you're not a sinner and you're lying. In chapter 3, he says, the children of God cannot go on sinning. So which one is it? There's some tension there. You could read books and books and books about this topic, uh, get down into the weeds. I think there's interesting thought on it. Um, but, but really, you know, as we look at which one it is, are, are we a people who cannot continue in sin if we're truly children of God? Or are we people uh, who are occasionally still living in sin? Uh, I'll take the politically correct route and say it's both. Uh, I really think it is both in a way. You know, we look at the text uh, and we see if, if we are living as God's children and the Holy Spirit is in us, He's not going to lead us into sin. He cannot lead us into sin. The Holy Spirit is perfectly righteous and, and pure and holy. So if, if He's in us, if the Holy Spirit is leading us and we're yielding to His leadership, we will not, we could not potentially sin uh, because He's leading the way. Uh, but the reality is, Oftentimes, we're not living as we ought to. We're not living as children of, of God. We're, we're making poor decisions. We're not following the leadership of the Holy Spirit, and we find ourselves in sin. Um, so, so there's this idea of perfection, but we wake up in the morning, and we look in the mirror, and we still see a sinner. We have to work through that. But this idea of perfection is set in front of us. It's really the goal uh, that we're after, Jesus, the embodiment of that. Now, is that too much to ask? Is it not spiritually healthy for me to stand here and say, uh, the expectation is striving for perfection? Should we not expect that of one another and encourage one another to be a people who are living perfectly just as uh, Jesus did? Uh, I want to share a couple pieces of scripture that will help inform this idea. Uh, the first is Matthew chapter 5. It's uh, part of the Sermon on the Mount. I'll start verse 43. Uh, Matthew 5, 43, it says this, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Interesting there, he's, he's talking about sonship, right? Uh, love them so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, 
what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? I mean, anybody can love someone who already loves them, right? That's not hard. It's not a challenge. It's easy. We can love people who already love us. Uh, If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than the others? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Verse 48, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Ugh, that's the standard Jesus sets before them. Uh, another example would be 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. Uh, it, it says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now, that's a call to perfection. Holiness uh, is completely perfect in the sight of God, and that's how we ought to live. Um, so that's really what's set in front of us, perfection. It's what we're striving after. Jesus is the embodiment of that. So if he is the goal, perfection is the goal, uh, how do we get there? And I see a couple things surface from the text. Uh, the first I want to talk about, uh, one way that I see described in the text today is that if we are in sin, we need to get out of it. it sounds simple, right? Kind of John's language. If you're in sin, get out of it so that we can get closer to Christ, closer to obtaining our goal. Wherever we find ourselves in sin, whether it's bigger sin or smaller sin, he's calling us to get out of it. Uh, Verse 6, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Uh, Verse 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Verse 6, no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. I think that's an interesting verse, the the two visuals there, seeing him or knowing him. Sin really blinds our eyes and it calluses our hearts. So no matter whether we're just handling a little bit of sin occasionally or we're living in sin, we're blinding ourselves. We can't see clearly. Our hearts are becoming calloused, so we can't know him intimately or in the way that he desires. Now, there's a, a common temptation, at least in my life, Uh, Maybe you've heard this run through your mind from time to time. Sometimes we might think, what's the big deal? What's the big deal if we just participate in some sinful living from time to time? Not even daily, you know, maybe just monthly. Just, uh, you know, we just want to do something to entertain ourselves occasionally. Is it really a big deal? Does God not... uh, does he really get upset with that? Isn't his grace sufficient? You know, he, he's full of grace. So forgive us if we step into that. Uh, I think that is a powerful lie from Satan uh, that sin is not a big deal, that small sin is not a big deal. Uh, the idea that we can still live completely for God while holding on to a few sinful behaviors. Now, understand with this that there is a difference in struggling with sin, wrestling with a sin that has hold of you, or, or you really despise the sin, you're trying to, to break free of that uh, through prayer and accountability. There's a big difference in that and consuming a sin that you've really just become content with. It's just a part of who you are. Uh, you know, that's just become part of your, your routine of life. Uh, that, that approach is what John is calling us away from, that we just kind of hold some sin casually and, and tell ourselves it's really not a big deal. You know, you think of uh, Larry Bird shooting 500 shots every day. You know, he's trying to develop muscle memory, so when he gets out on the court, he can just let him fly with confidence. Uh, so imagine you go up to Larry Bird as he's practicing, and you say, Hey, Larry, why don't you just move your elbow over a couple inches when you're shooting? Just move your elbow out a little bit. He's going to laugh at us, right? There's no way he's going to adjust his shot because, you know, that's a small adjustment, only a couple inches, but it's going to throw the trajectory of the ball off completely. So that takes a shot from probably going in uh, to clanging off the side of the rim or airballing. You know, he's going to lose a game because of it or lose the championship because of it. He's not going to mess with those mechanics, those fundamentals. In the same way with our sin, uh, we can't allow ourselves to think, oh, just a little bit of of sin consumption isn't going to hurt us too much, that little bit of sin consumption has the potential to change the, com- the whole trajectory of our entire life. You know, all the big uh, sinful problems that people find themselves in start with something small. Uh, so we can't allow ourselves uh, to think that, that it's not a big deal. You know, Eve, all she did was take a bite of an apple, right? It was not a big problem. Huge consequences. David, 
All he did was took one look at a woman taking a bath on the roof. It was just an innocent look, not a big deal. What happens? The next thing you know, he's calling for the, the woman's husband to be killed. He's, he's calling for murder. You see this time and again throughout Scripture uh, where something small turns into something big. Uh, John says, verse 7, little children, let no one deceive you. He, he's speaking this in love, little children. He, he loves them. He's compassionate towards them. But don't let anyone deceive you. Don't let anyone think, let you think that, that some small step to the side of pursuing Christ isn't going to matter. Uh, pursue him with everything you have. You know, I, I think there's a real chance that the, the little sins we have that we tolerate in our life are really uh, preventing our spiritual growth and our ability to go spiritually deeper than the big sins that always come to mind. You know, we think, well, I, I got rid of all these big sins. I'm not really struggling with those, so I can go deeper with Christ. But I think in a real way, it's those little sins that we hold on to that are holding us back. You know, because if, if you think of drawing near to Christ, he's, he's centrally located. We can't bring any of that close to Christ, right? It's holding us back. So if we cut those sins off, then it allows us to go uh, deeper with Christ, to be more intimate in our relationship with Christ, to know him better. Uh, the other thing it does, it kind of leaves open this, this wound or this hole because every small sin we commit is feeding some bigger desire that we have, right? It, it's feeding some sort of discontentment, whether it's uh, pride or, uh, you know, a desire uh, for power, uh, insecurity, all, all the small sins are fueling something else. So if we cut those off, now we've just cut the supply uh, of what's feeding our pridefulness or, or this desire that we have. So what happens is that desire either shrinks away and dies because we've starved it, or we find something else to feed it with, Jesus and he purifies it and transforms it into the people that we should be. Uh, so he has to be the one who satisfies all of our needs. Uh, and really, that's his promise, that he will do that. We just have to trust that he will, uh, that he can satisfy us more than anything this world has to offer. Uh, so we can't be deceived. Uh, small sins are always fueling, feeding bigger desires uh, that haven't been completely surrendered to God. Um, second part of this, all this being said, I do want to guard against this becoming too much of a formula, uh, that it's all in our strength. We just cut off these sins and take care of a few things in our life, carve those out, and all of a sudden we'll have a good relationship uh, with Jesus. Uh, if we want to get at the heart of God, we want to be obtaining the goal, Jesus Christ, uh, if we really want to live in righteousness, then our only hope is the love and grace of God. Our only hope to obtaining that is the love and grace of God. We're never going to get there in our own strength. Uh, you think of Larry Bird. To the men here today, uh, could you ever be as good as Larry Bird with the skill set you have right now? I imagine most of us are going to say no, right? We can put in hours and hours and hours of practice. We will never be able to beat Larry Bird. He has too much God-given talent. He's six feet, nine inches tall. He's a, uh, a competitor that most people don't even understand, right? We just don't have that. We can't do it in our own strength. It's the same with the Christian life. Like, we can strive for perfection. We can strive for Jesus. We want to obtain him. We will never get there in our own strength. We just can't do it. We need that God-given talent. We need the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And as he lives in us, all of a sudden we have this ability uh, to, to do something, to accomplish something that we knew nothing of before. Really, it makes us uh, a new creation uh, as, as we receive that. So this means that the Christian living is not some burden, some responsibility, uh, a to-do list of do this, don't do that. Uh, Christian living becomes this joyous response to a gift that God gives us, right? Uh, we get to receive Jesus, and our response to that is uh, spirit-inspired uh, obedience and righteous living, which is really our greatest joy. It's our greatest joy to do the things that God has created us to do. Um, you might remember last week, Pastor Josh, he read First uh, John chapter 3, verse 1. It says this, it says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, 
that we should be called children of God. And so we are. Like that last statement, just matter of fact. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. This sonship, daughtership, to to be a, a part of God's family, we didn't earn that. That was just given to us. That's God's love and God's grace. God so loved the world that he gave his only son for our sake, right? That's a gift of love and grace. And as we receive that, we understand the love and grace of Jesus Christ um, as he lived that out. Our only response can be a response of gratitude. And how we do that is to live as he calls us to live. And it's our greatest joy because we get to do what God has created us to do. That's what we see in the text. The children of God, they love righteousness. They live in righteousness. They don't keep on sinning because they, they don't like it. You know, a good example of this is Paul. You can read about Paul in chapter 7 and 8. And he's dealing with this struggle. He wants perfection. He wants Jesus. Like, he, he wants to get there. He says he considers everything a loss compared to knowing Jesus. He'd give it all away just to have Jesus. But in Romans 7 and 8, you see that he's recognizing he can't do it. He's saying, all this this stuff I want to do, I can't do it. And all the stuff I don't want to do, I keep on doing it. He's struggling with sin in his life. He finally gets to a point, he says, what a wretched man I am. Who's going to deliver me from this? Like, I want perfection, but I can't do it. Who's going to deliver me? I'm just this wretched man. And he ends by saying, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That was the only way he could get there, and he he got it. He understood it, that it was by receiving Christ uh, that he could have that perfection. The only way that God looks upon us and sees this righteousness is if his son Jesus is living inside of us. And as he lives inside of us, then uh, God sees that righteousness, uh, not our shortcomings. So, We'll invite you uh, to imagine that tomorrow morning you wake up and God has given you the talent of your favorite artist or your favorite athlete or musician. Uh, So you wake up with the ability uh, to create music like the best people who have ever lived or to compete at basketball like the greatest athletes who ever played. You you just have this talent. God gave it to you. What are you going to do with that? You're going to put it into practice, right? Because you're going to enjoy it because you're good at it and it brings other people pleasure. You, you can create paintings that, that could bring people to tears. You can create music that inspires people. Uh, you could play basketball in a way that people across the country want to watch you play because uh, you compete so well. Look at this Zion Williamson guy. Everybody wants to see him, right? He's amazing. That's God-given talent. He put some work into it to develop it. But a lot of that's God-given talent. And that's what God is inviting us to. You've been given this God-given talent. You've been given this gift. You are a child of God. Now go and celebrate it. Like Start designing what God calls you to design and create what God desires you to create. And the idea is we, as we live that out, people look at it and they see the glory of Christ. They see the beauty of the kingdom of God and they may want to know who is it that is giving you this. Right? The fulfillment, the purpose that we have in spiritual things. They want to know about that as we live it out. Uh, that's the invitation of God. It's, it's the encouragement of John here. Put into practice the righteous things that God is calling you to. Uh, I do really think this text, uh, for the believer, it's encouragement. It's a reminder. For, for the person who's maybe wrestling with the faith, maybe been sitting on the sidelines, or maybe you're not really a follower of Christ, it's an invitation It's an invitation to come and see who this person Jesus is, uh, to jump in to this righteous living and to discover uh, really the fulfillment that it brings uh, in a way that uh, the things of this world just aren't capable of doing. Uh, So this week, I encourage you, practice daily. Put it into practice. Uh, Practice at home, practice at work, practice with your spouse and your children. Uh, Let's go and see who God wants us to be. Let's go and see who God wants us to meet, what he wants us to do. That life seeking after Christ is going to be the most exciting life we can ever have on this earth. It's the most fulfilling life that we can have on this earth. It'll bring greater fulfillment than anything uh, we think we want to pursue. Uh, So we got to just trust God with that. 
uh, see what he has in store for us uh, and, and trust that it's going to be beneficial to his kingdom as well. Um, if you want to start with that, you're not sure where, obviously uh, let me know, let a, another pastor know, elder friend in the church. Uh, I think you know you jump into to learning what God calls us to uh, through scripture. Uh, there's no more exciting journey to see people uh, start in that. So I'd love to walk with you uh, through that process. Uh, let me pray for us and we'll be done. Father God, uh, I believe the word exists uh, still today for a reason. I believe it's true and uh, useful for giving us guidance, uh, for giving us wisdom and instruction uh, to rebuke us where we need it, correct us. Uh, so God, wherever it met with us today in our heart, I pray that we would have time after this service to just think on those things, uh, pray about those things. Uh, Lord, we recognize our shortcomings, the, the expectation, the requirement for entrance into your kingdom is perfection and holiness. Uh, and God, we just stand here and recognize we don't have it in our own strength. We fall short time and again. Uh, so we're just so grateful for your grace and your love that continues to call us back to repentance. Uh, Lord, forgive us. Uh, for the small sins we convince ourselves aren't offensive to you. Forgive us for forgetting that uh, the smallest sin would have sent your son Jesus to the cross. Uh, it all began with the bite of an apple. So Lord, uh, if there be any small sin in our life, uh, let us understand that it's huge, that it's changing the trajectory of, of our lives and our relationship with you and uh, help us have a desire to get it rid of it. Lord, don't let us think that we can do it in our own strength, but let us depend on you. Uh, Holy Spirit, pray that you would help us with that, give us joy in it, that it wouldn't be a burden, that, uh, that obedience to you would truly be our greatest pleasure, uh, that we'd find fulfillment in it, a purpose in it that this world can't offer. Uh, so God, just pray you'd go with us this week. Uh, keep us safe till we meet again. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.